of one to scream in on the top of your lungs. How was your day today? I, I don't think that's the top of your lungs. Hold on, want to try again? Guys, how was your day today? Woo! That's better. We're almost at the end of the day, so it's almost time to say goodbye. Uh. But we have one big finale for you. So we're going to leave you in good hands. We have one parting gift. Ula, would you like to do the honors? I would love to. Because now, in front of you, the award-winning actor, author, performer, and astronaut, Mr. William Shatner! No! Have you had a good time here? I'm so tired. I flew in uh, on um, Friday, Friday night from Los Angeles, which I believe is exactly 12 hours different. So when it's daytime here, it's nighttime at home. I'm not sure what time it is. But you know what jet lag is? I've seen people in jet, me in jet lag, going to a performance of a friend, friends of mine are on stage, you know, it's nighttime, and this thing hits you and you go, I can't do that. And you, you know, because people are taking pictures, and then you go, I'm gonna be, that's what's happening to me now. You hit a wall, and you suddenly you're, you're tired. So I am so glad to be in your town. I was looking for German food for two days. There's no German food in Germany. It's a bad thing. So they went out and got me two uh, sausages for lunch. Delicious. <laughs> they said, oh, you know, uh, 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 what's the pounded thing? The, the uh, Wiener Schnitzel. Where were you when I need you? No, no, nothing. So they said, you know, the Wiener Schnitzel is a... I said, give me, I'll get some Wiener Schnitzel for last night's dinner. So eventually the Wiener Schnitzel comes up and it's cold. Ah, you have cold Wiener Schnitzel. <laughs> it's terrible! And wait, that's what you should do about jet lag. Eat cold Wiener Schnitzel. Oh, you're awake because it tastes so bad. But the sausages were really good. Kind of like out of time uh, to get German food. It's getting really good German. What is German cuisine? Is it like spaghetti? Is it like fish? Is it like heavy meat? No. <laughs> anyway, uh, I've had a, a, a great time. I've met a lot of really lovely people in, in, uh, in town here. And I'm so glad to have been amongst you. So I've got a few minutes with you. And my God, look way back there. Yeah. So I, how to start these things is always a little awkward. Like, like meeting somebody for the first time in a room. Hi, uh, and then you don't know what to say. So ask me a question, but get right close to the microphone. No, that's it. Okay, I thought you were gonna come this way without the microphone. Uh, right, kiss the microphone. Let me hear you kiss it. I know Mr. Shana, it is not. No, no, you have to kiss it. Okay. Kiss the microphone. Okay. There. <laughs> now you're kissing. Um, um, purse your lips a little. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Cold Wiener Schnitzel to you, sir. <laughs> What's your question? Hello, Mr. Chapter. It is an honor to meet you. My question is, 
Which is your favorite episode of the Star Trek original series? I, I, my favorite episode? I, I, I've never been asked that before. <laughs> I'll tell you how bad it is, okay? Not bad, how unusual. So, I know I'm addressing an educated audience, so you all know who Stephen Hawking is, right? Dr. Stephen Hawking, who had ALS and was in a wheelchair for a while, but one of the great minds of the 20th century. Sir, what's your name? Jan. Yanni? Jan, uh, Jan, in English, uh, you say No, Jan. no, no, we're in Germany. Uh, Jan. Jani? Yes. What's it like in English? Uh, re repeat? No, uh, it's Jani. Jani, you know that Dr. Stephen Hawking uh, wrote, oh, many books, one on time and the existence of time, time, space, I mean, all these exotic uh, scientific principles none of which I understand, and everybody, every great scientist that I've met, I'd say, explain um, time and space. And I want time and space, and they're going, well, that's time and that's space. I mean, if the furthest galaxy that we can see is 13.8 billion light years away, then a photon of light has to reach that far galaxy and get to our retina, that photon of light, which may be a particle or a wave, and I don't know what that means either. So it goes across 13.8 billion light years, and it takes 13.8 billion light years to get there. What's the time-space thing? I don't get it. I know that that photon of light is bouncing from gravitational field to gravitational field, it just takes longer, right? Because it's going in a circuitous route. But I don't get it. But Dr. Stephen Hawking did get it. He understood the existence of time and how time changes. And in addition to writing about time, his thesis was black holes, black holes in space. His idea was there's got to be something consuming the energy in a galaxy. And he named it a dark hole. It was a theory until they began to see it and realize that the center of every galaxy is a black hole. <laughs> That's the Venus. So. I was doing an interview show called I Don't Understand. That was the title of the interview show. Because I don't understand anything. I mean, I don't understand what we're doing here. So, so I had a show called I Don't Understand. And I called Dr. Hawking up. I, I, I sent a message to him saying I would like to interview him. Now, he had come to the Star Trek set some years earlier. And I took him around and I showed him the engine room and pointed out what on Star Trek we called dilithium crystals. It was the energy of the ship. And, and I said, and Dr. Hawking, by that time, he was in a wheelchair, but he was, he was able to talk and move around. And I said, uh, here's uh, dilithium crystals. And he looked at me and he said, I'm working on that. Which became the title of a book I wrote while I'm working on that. And I went to several universities for advanced, uh, uh, what, what, what people were working on in, in the future. That was so many years ago that everything they were working on is now almost past history. In any case, I got slightly acquainted with Dr. Stephen Hawking. So now, I, I get in touch with him and said, I'd like to interview you. And he says, that's fine. Uh, you interview me, but you have to ex ask the exact question. Write me the questions you want to ask me. And uh, because, uh, as you know, I can't speak. And 
what he had. It's a choice between using my hands and not drinking the water or drinking the water and using my hands. So, as he lost his ability to speak and to use his body, they attached a little electronic thing on his cheek muscle, because that was the only muscle he could use. He, as you probably know, he was, would be in a wheelchair like this, totally helpless, except for this little mouse. And you're wondering what the hell has this got to do with the favorite thing, right? I'm getting to it. Circuitous route. Uh, why, why go directly to something when you could be a photon of light bouncing around the gravitational field? So he had this little electronic thing attached to his cheek muscle. And in order to, to talk to you, he would move the cheek muscle ever so slightly, which corresponded with something on his computer, which then uh, signaled the letters he wished to spell, and then when he had spelled out his answer to a question or a statement, he would then hit the button for the computer to speak, and the computer would say this is his message. So he said, the, so you have to write out the questions exactly as you want them to ask me, because any variation, I can't vary. Understood. So, I'm now in Cambridge, where he was located. And so the whole film company was there shooting, came, filming Cambridge, and we even filmed in the, in the uh, cathedral that's in Cambridge. So, I found myself that afternoon waiting to go to his house sitting in the cathedral where that thing, where the building goes several floors up, and uh, there's a name for it, I don't remember, but it has stained glass window. And I'm sitting there alone in this incredible cathedral, and there is a person cleaning the organ. So every so often there'd be a, uh, a Beethoven, Frame, bomb, and then it would echo through the cathedral. Sitting there in the midst of this building erected to the to the the religious answer to what are we doing here? And I'm looking up in, and I spot a moat of dust caught in the sunlight. Wow! And then, for some reason, my mind went to. That's what the Earth must look like from other parts of the universe. Our, our galaxy must look like a moat of dust. A little while later, I'm in the uh, I'm in the uh, house that uh, Dr. Hawking uh, Dr. Hawking's house, and he he's wheeled in, and I'm sitting here. He's right there, and I can see his computer. And Dr. Hawking had said, ask me anything you want, but then, uh, Shackner, I'd like to ask you a question. And I thought, he wants to ask me a question. It's probably about time, whether, you know, my views on time or dark holes or, or the energy in the universe, you know, something really that he thinks I might know, because I'm Captain Kirk. So, I'm sitting there beside Dr. Hawking, and, uh, and uh, so I asked him the question, whatever the questions were, I'm reading them off the card over there, and Dr. Hawking, the meaning of time, and he, well, and he punches up the voice, and the voice gives the answer, <clears throat> and then I asked him, enough, I asked him about three or four questions, and the computer answered the question. And then that was essentially it. And then I said, but Dr. Hawking, you said that you wanted to ask me a question. So, dark matter? What, what do you want to know, Dr. Hawking? And he starts to spell out his question. 
What is your favorite episode? That's the truth. Even Dr. Hawking, one of the great minds of the 20th century, wanted to know what you want to know. The meaning of life. You could have asked me, why are we here? What is time? But no, you asked me the same ridiculous question of like, what are my favorite children? Like, which child do I love the most? City across the river. No, you're supposed to laugh at that. I just made my. I don't know. I don't remember them. I never looked at them when I made them. I learned the words and forgot the words. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I do remember some, but they, you know, Star Trek wrote at its best. Wrote about the mysteries of of what we're talking about, existence, and you know. All, all the deep questions that uh, we ask ourselves in, in life. So the best Star Treks ask those questions in, in uh, uh, science fiction terms and sought to give an answer. But that's, I, I really couldn't tell you which is my favorite answer. You good with that? It's a non-answer to a non-question. Uh, yes, and thanks for an amazing answer.